Good morning, everybody, and welcome to your Florida-friendly winter landscape. Um, I am Lily Browning. I'm the Florida-friendly landscaping program coordinator. I work for Hernando County Utilities, and the weather cooperated fantastically with my subject line this morning, which is why I'm all bundled up and you can see my frosty front lawn behind me. Um, I'm not really out there, I'm inside. But anyway, um, actually the weather um, decided to have a freeze last night, early this morning. So if you go back, I actually did a, a, a shorter pre-recorded class on Monday to stay ahead of this, this weather front in which I um, told you very specific things about plant protection. So I'll mention that class again at the end. And some of these slides you will have you there in both um, in both classes, but I'm, I'll try not to dwell on the ones that I already talked about on Monday. See, that's the thing now where everything is um, on Zoom and everything is recorded. In, in, in the other life, <laughs> I used to be able to go to this group of people and then go to another group of people and tell them the exact same thing. I can't really get away with that now that everything's being recorded. It's kind of like, ah, oh, that's a Lily rerun. We don't want to hear that again. So I will not dwell on so much the plant protection because if you are interested in that, it is uh, covered more in depth. Um, you can find the video on my Facebook page as well as on Hernando County Government YouTube. But let's get started with your Florida friendly winter landscape. Oh, I have four people in the waiting room. Let me let them in. Okay. These are the nine principles of Florida friendly landscaping. You will see them in all of my classes. And um, with this winter landscape, we're really gonna concentrate on that number one that right plan in the right place. But actually we're gonna cover uh, uh, ear, uh, watering efficiently, fertilizing appropriately, mulch. Attract wildlife was covered in another class and I will talk about that at the end. We'll touch on uh, manage yard pests responsibly and um, um, seven, eight, and nine will work their way in there as well. These are the nine principles. So everything a Florida friendly landscaping program coordinator or extension agent is going to talk about or refer to is gonna um, always come back to one or more of these principles. So let's first talk about the five things that you should be doing in your landscape in Florida winter. We are here in Central Florida. That is where I am speaking from. I am speaking from Hernando County, which is about 40 miles north of Tampa. Um, this, photo, this scenery behind me, I took it this morning in my front lawn. So, and I spoke to um, the Florida Friendly Landscaping Program Coordinator in Pasco County. He lives further south down in Pasco. Um, and he said he just had like the slightest little bit of frost on top of his car and on top of the cardboard that he was protecting his tomatoes with. That is, I mean, Florida has a big difference depending how far north you go. If you notice, if you, you know, watch the Tampa news and watch the weather, it will say, well, it's going to be, you know, 50 tonight in Tampa and, uh, you know, below 50 in Brooksville. Not, not really to that extreme, but it might, they may say, uh, you know, 50 in Tampa and 42 in Brooksville. And you know, it's always gonna be the coldest spot for some reason. And I'm even further north and northwest of Brooksville and kind of an open plain area. So I do experience a lot of the frosts when they do happen. Here in Central Florida, I have lived here most of my life. I have lived here for 42 years. Um, I said that was most of my life, not all of my life. And I can tell you the uh, past decade 
we haven't had a real winter. So if you are new here and you know you don't think we can get that cold, we can below 20s, not unheard of at all. It's not unusual here in Hernando County. We've seen 17, we've seen 15, um, and but not in a long time. So today, when we touched, you know, right at 32, maybe it went a little lower in your yard. Um, it's not as cold as it can get. But so you should prepare for a cold weather event. Um, and, you know, we could have a freeze really anytime between now or even sometimes in November through usually about March 15th. Now, now don't hold me to that because this past decade has been unusual. And um, uh, what's happened is that, you know, once in a while we've had a couple frost or freeze events past on March 15th, even at the beginning of April. But usually, generally, it's gonna be March 15th. So if you do have cold sensitive plants, what I've got going on right now is I, I didn't bring anything in. I mean, I used to, but after a while, I just, it's, it's um, tough love out there. You know, it's survival of the fittest. I don't have a whole lot of sensitive plants. I do have one um, staghorn fern, but it, you know, it kind of lives under the trees and I just, um, you know, see what happens with it and it hasn't frozen yet. Um, but if you do have cold sensitive plants, they do need to be brought in. It's usually best to keep those in pots with wheels <laughs> so you can drag them into the garage if necessary or have covers ready. And one of the important things uh, to think about is if you're trying to assess how your plants will respond. Is this a gradual or a sudden cold front? If it's a gradual cold front, your plants have been acclimatized and they're probably gonna do just fine. That rarely happens in Florida though. <laughs> we were 80 just the other day, weren't we? Just a day or two ago and then boom, we're freezing tonight. And that's usually how it happens. So our poor plants don't get well acclimatized, but the right plant, right place, and especially the native plants, they're used to this. They know how to handle it. This you'll see in my other program that I did on Monday, but it does bear repeating um, how you cover, um, how you try to cover your plants is important. If you try what's happening on the right here, you are expending your energy uh, for no benefit. Whoops. Uh, you're just creating lollipops out of your trees for no particular reason. It's not going to accomplish anything for you. And as I explained in the other video, um, what we're trying to do when we cover plants is capture that radiant heat from the ground. Um, what has occurred, what we're, our ground, our ground doesn't freeze because the air doesn't freeze long enough for it to affect the ground. Even if we're getting down to like the, below the 20s, our ground is still probably going to get, from what I um, heard in my college classes, you know, like 48 at the least. So it's a lot warmer in that ground than in the air. And covering plants, what we are trying to accomplish is capturing the radiant heat from the ground. Therefore, we want to create a tent, uh, not a lollipop. Wrapping up of a plant isn't going to do any good. It can't generate its own heat. We need to try and capture that radiant heat from the ground. And it doesn't need to be, you know, 60, 70 degrees in there. It just needs to be above 33, really. And here's good ways to go about doing it. Here on the right, um, there's been these uh, little tents that either somebody created uh, to uh, specifically to protect plants or you know, maybe they were little displays in a camping store or something. Regardless, they work fantastic. The most correct way, the most ideal situation is you're covering a plant 
with a cover that reaches all the way to the ground and that doesn't touch the plant. That's the ideal situation. And boxes can accomplish that um, with smaller plants. Uh, don't tell Carmen Bruno that, you know, I showed this picture again where someone's using recycling bins <laughs> to accomplish that, but just make sure you put your recycling back in them and, you know, use them for the appropriate uh, use as well. Um, if you have to use a cover, because sometimes, obviously, some of the bigger plants, there's not a cover big enough, you can't build a tent around it, and you can't go, you know, rent a circus tent or something to put around it. So you're going to end up touching it. So the main thing you're going to want to do is make sure it's a cloth, not plastic. Plastic is going to transfer the, the cold to those leaves um, and cause more damage. So even an old sheet um, will work well. The main thing that you want to do is make sure it reaches all the way to the ground, kind of you know, sprawling from the ground, put some weight, some rocks or something on it so it doesn't blow off so that you are holding that heat in. And uncover it again. <laughs> it is, let me see what is, it is out there right now. Oh, I can't really tell. Oh yeah, my phone sometimes tells me it's about 45. So, you know, in another hour or so, go out and uncover them. Um, they do need they do need the daylight and it's going to warm up again. This is the coldest it's going to be in the next 11 days, uh, the, that 32 that we had this morning. Here's some other things that you can do in your winter landscape. Mulch. Mulch uh, plays an important part in a Florida friendly landscape in general, but it also plays an important part in um, cold protection gonna hold that uh, temperature of that soil in there, creating a little bit of insulation for your roots. Also, this is a great time of year for us to go out and work in the yard because it's not a trillion degrees and it seems more comfortable to work out there. So, you know, it's a great time to refresh your mulch. A lot of the summer weeds are dying out, so pull them out and you know, refresh your mulch beds, make them look nice. <clears throat> the benefits of mulching is, you know, it does uh, prevent erosion, it prevents the loss of water. It does suppress weeds, but, you know, we are gonna say we've seen fantastic weeds growing on top of mulch. Well, sure, you know, it's a great medium for any plant, but we have to keep after it, keep it looking nice. Um, just like our own, our own beds in our bedroom, you know, after we've slept in it, they don't look pretty and nice anymore. So after a while, your own beds and full of mulch, you know, you need to remake that bed. Um, it, the mulch adds nutrient, um, each nutrient holding capacity really, and water holding uh, capacity to your soil as it breaks down into our sandy soil. Um, but it holds that radiant heat from the ground in for your roots and helps insulate the soil. And also the opposite way, it helps um, keep the soil a little cooler in the winter, in the summer, in the heat. So while we're talking about mulch, what type of mulch should we get? Well, you want to get something that was once alive. That is one of the, the rule of thumbs. And, um, you know, yard waste and leaves. Why not? That's what happens in the forest. The, you know, no reason not to use that. Pine straw is a great one. I just showed you some in the last slide. I like pine nuggets. I like to go and get pine nuggets. Um, pine is a sustainable um, product. You know, they have, it's a fast growing product that they have plantations for. So then they take down the pines and they have replanted to replace them. Um, actually, I know somebody who has, owns a bunch of, you know, pine um, stands in Georgia, where his mother actually does, and um, pine straw is, that's the thing in Georgia and the Atlanta area. I mean, the expensive homes there and stuff are after the pine straw, so she actually makes more money 
on the pine straw than she actually does on the pine trees. Um, but I like the big pine nuggets because it takes them a good long time to break down. Pine straw is great. I have it around free, so I would just um, sometimes I break it into my beds, um, but it's going to break down pretty quickly. Those pine nuggets, they work great because they cover well because of their size, you know, they're kind of big and they take longer to break down. Uh, Melaleuca mulch, that is a fantastic mulch. You can find it under the, uh, the brand name Flora mulch. Um, it is from a Melaleuca tree, which is an invasive exotic tree in South Florida. So this way you are promoting you know, the removal of those trees. You do wanna make sure though that you buy them commercially where they have been heat treated and the weed seeds gone from them so you don't you know create more of a problem eucalyptus mulch um, has a you know nice eucalyptusy smell to it um, also from it's a sustainable um, resource utility mulch that means you know you see the guys out there cutting the trees and all that i always um extend some caution with that first of all don't use it right away they're cutting down, uh, they are cutting down, you know, green, green limbs, green trees, things like that. So um, it needs to take a while to break down or else the energy and the heat it releases could be too much for your bed that you put it in and um, cause plant death. Another thing is, you know, what is their job, either the electric company or even the county, um, you know, clearing, viewing sites for the roadways. What is their job? Their job is the safety of those power lines. Their job is the safety of being able to see around the corner or being able to see, it, see a stop sign or on a sidewalk, not walking into a bush or something like that. That's their one and only concern. Not what kind of tree it is or not, you know, how it's shaped, what it looks like. Their one and only concern is safety. That's what you know we we have them for. So you don't know what kind of trees they have chipped up. They just all get it out of our way, put it in the chipper, ship it up. And or does it have invasive vines or something like that on it? So you have to be really careful that you don't bring any invasive materials into your yard when you ask for free utility mulch. What we don't want you to use is um, rubber mulch. Um, going back to that first one and the other column, okay, uh, if there's any, you know, science uh, geeks on here, yeah, rubber mulch was once alive about a million years ago. Um, but, you know, it's made out of grind up tires. And so you have petroleum, you have heavy metals, probably not any, anything, adding anything good to the soil. Um, not to mention it in the summer, it attracts a lot of heat. It smells like rubber and it's just, uh, it still has sometimes the little steel belts in it. So it's, it's not recommended by Florida friendly landscaping. Neither is cypress mulch. And a lot of people get surprised by that. Don't, you know, don't freak out and go out and pick up every little bit of cypress mulch you might have in your yard. It's not gonna hurt your yard. This goes back to the ethical situation. We like the sustainable practices um, from, you know, like the pine and the melaleuca, the eucalyptus, all of that. Cypress mulch, they're not using sustainable practices to acquire that cypress mulch. Um, they go into the wetlands, take down very young trees because there's no old ones left and then immediately shred them down to sell to us as mulch. So yeah, it's there, it's the cheapest, but it's not something Florida Friendly uh, Landscaping recommends for ethical reasons. Rocks, I love rocks. Rocks are some of my favorite things. I mean, I have a couple of rocks just sitting here <laughs> at my desk because I just like to hold them, you know, it gives you kind of that sense of peace. So I love rocks. Um, but you don't want to use them as an entire mulch. That might work up north. You do see it a lot up north. 
um, down here, we want to try to add something, you know, back to our sandy soil and as well as uh, heat, you know, it, rocks are going to gather a lot of heat in the summer. So use rocks in moderation, use them decoratively is what I do. Okay, let's see if we can get you to move. There we go. How are we going to put that mulch down? You really only want to use a two to three inch uh, layer of mulch. Um, more than that, you're wasting your money and you know, you're not doing anything good for the plant. You don't want it to touch the plant. You don't want it right up against a tree or a shrub because then it's going to hold the moisture against that trunk and that's an invitation uh, for insects. It's an invitation for fungal problems. So pull it away from the trunks, only have two to three inches. We drive around and we see this volcano mulching that's going on all around us. I took some pictures, I saw some in a big box store very close by here. That is this equivalent to planting a plant too deeply, and I discussed that a lot in, a, in other videos, um, that, that plant needs to breathe. Trees at the bottom, as you see on the bottom right, they have what you call a flare. And um, there's a uh, campaign going on, I believe started by Whitney Elmore, who's the director of Pasco County Extension Office. And I may as well plug that she will be with Dr. Lester and I tomorrow at the virtual plant clinic at 10 o'clock. Um, anyway, she started a free the flare campaign. <laughs> So whenever you see, you know, a poor covered up buried tree like this, that's a waste of your money. Um, it holds too much moisture, obviously, against the trunk. It doesn't allow oxygen to get to the trunk. And another thing it could do is form like a, like a thatch around there. So where the moisture actually sheds off of that hump like an umbrella. Therefore, you're depriving the tree of moisture as well. So no volcano mulching, save, save the tree and save your money. Something else you can do when maybe there's not a whole lot to do like in the, uh, with the flower beds or things like that, it's a good time to start looking at your equipment. We're gonna talk somewhat about your irrigation system and how much water your lawn may need or doesn't need at this time of year. But some other things, um, you know, it's a good time. Like I said, the weather is pleasant. So you make sure you sharpen your mower blades. You should be doing that throughout the year. But if you haven't done that, you want to make sure um, that you have nice sharp mower blades. This picture, that's not wiring down there on that picture with that, with that hand. That's actually um, blades of grass. And it's showing you what a dull blade uh, will do. It, it, it tears the grass and then it makes it very susceptible to other problems. A nice sharp blade cuts it. Every time you mow, you're pruning your grass. And pruning is wounding every plant. Pruning is wounding and in, including your lawn. So it's stressful. So if you do it uh, poorly, you open the door for many other problems. So you always wanna have a very sharp blade um, when you're pruning your lawn, when you're mowing your lawn. And it's a good time to check out that weird mysterious uh, irrigation clock in your garage as well. Did you change it for the end of daylight savings time? Mm. <laughs> you know, um, is your rain sensor on? Is it functioning properly? And basically what I'm gonna tell you for this time of year is I would take that dial and move it over to that pink part over to off. And I'll explain why, because I really think this is a time of year we should be watering on an as needed basis. Here we go. This is a campaign from the Southwest Florida Water Management District. They've been doing for several years now, skip a week. Even though it's usually pretty warm out here during the winter, um, as I explain in my video I did Monday, we have winter for three days at a time. <laughs> 
and then it'll be warm again. Then we might have another three days of winter. And that's basically how it works here in central Florida. So, you know, it's pretty warm, but your grass isn't really growing, is it? Are you out there mowing it as much? Is it growing as much? No, it is actually, all of our lawns here in central Florida are warm season lawns. That means they're actively growing, obviously, in the warm season. And you're going to say, well, it's warm. How does it know that it's winter? When you get home from work, is it dark? <laughs> or when you're done with work, I should say, um, is it dark? Yeah, these are the shorter daylight hours. That's what a lot of our plants are reacting to. That's how they know it's winter. And they slow down in their growth. Our lawns go into a semi-dormant um, stage. So they actually slough off a whole bunch of its root system. Therefore, if it's not actively growing, it's, you can very easily skip a week of watering. So that's why I said, put that to off and then just keep an eye on your lawn and go out and have a talk with it and ask it if it needs water. Now, before you think I'm too crazy, <laughs> um, how do you do that? Well, uh, the University of Florida always talks about this blue-gray tint. I'm not sure I would catch on to that, <laughs> you know, what a blue-gray tint is. But these other two signs are very obvious. So I always like to promote those. If you walk across your lawn and your footprints remain there for a period of time, that means your lawn is getting dehydrated. So you'll be like, oh, okay, yeah, I see. And then you look and if over 50% of the blades are folding in half, it's trying to conserve water, shut out a little bit of photosynthesis there and conserve water. So those two signs are how your lawn's gonna tell you, I could use a little bit of water here. Don't panic and go turn on your irrigation system because it might not be your irrigation day here in Hernando County. If it doesn't rain between that time that you see these signs and the time that you're allowed to water, then go ahead and move that dial over to on and let it go through its, its system and um, then put it back to off again. Your lawn only needs about half an inch to three quarters of an inch of water per watering event. So that doesn't necessarily mean once a week. It's when it tells you it needs some water. Um, I had a phone call yesterday. Someone was unhappy with the uh, how high her bill was. And it didn't seem like there was any other major issues. So that's when they get sent to me and we talk about watering your lawn and things like that. Um, I would say lawns are the biggest water user in Hernando County, but that's apps actually not technically true. Lawns use as much water as they need to use. No less and no more. Lawns aren't the water users, it's the humans who put the most water on the lawns that um, is the actual technical thing that's happening. 60% of our water uh, in our municipal uh, water system is being put on people's lawns. So we need to realize it doesn't need it actually as much water as we think it does. That half an inch to three quarters of an inch, what it's gonna do is reach down um, about a foot into the soil. And even in the summer, the uh, roots are only gonna go down about eight inches. In the winter, they're hardly there at all. So that's why we don't need to be as concerned about watering. And when I'm talking about that, I'm talking about your Floritan St. Augustine lawn. If you have a Bahia grass lawn, that's what's behind me, Bahia grass and weeds, um, <laughs> it's gonna turn brown now. It's, oh, I'm sorry, I violated my own rule. It's gonna turn golden now um, that it's been frosted. I don't even have an irrigation system. I'm not gonna worry about it. The first, um, the first, rain that we have 
is going to, let me go back there. The first rain that we have in the spring, I could probably stand out there and watch it turn green. <laughs> that's, that's the beauty of the Haya grass. St. Augustine grass, you might wanna keep an eye on in the winter. Now you're gonna ask, how long do I put on each systems to, to verify each zone? to verify get that half inch to three quarters of an inch. I don't know, I can't tell you that. Um, it depends, there's so many variables. Your water pressure, how many zones you have, what kind of heads are in your zone, all of that. So here's a very simple thing to do. You see these containers around in this yard here. You can use that, uh, those plastic containers. You can use tuna cans, cat food cans, get your shark, get your, a measuring stick and a Sharpie and measure half an inch. Then mark that in, in those cans. And then place them randomly around each zone, turn that zone on, time how long it took to fill up the cans to that half inch. And then you're gonna write that down. Oh, that was zone one. You can see zone one and that took 25 minutes. So I'm gonna set zone one at 25 minutes and go around and do each zone that way. And you'll be sure um, that it gets the water that it needs and not too much. It's not an exact science, but it's probably a lot better than what you've got going on already. And check your rain sensor. It should be standing upright like this one on the left. Shouldn't be sideways, shouldn't be upside down, shouldn't be hanging off of there, shouldn't be mounted under the eave nor should there be a tree branch growing over it. The rain sensor um, is good if you leave your irrigation system on um, to let your system know, hey, we've had a decent amount of rain because you're gonna set it at that half inch or three quarters of an inch. Um, and there's this, this type, there's a cork inside that swells up and then that sends an electrical impulse to the system. Don't turn on until that cork dries back out. So that will also help save you some uh, money on your water bill as well. If you're gonna use that irrigation system, though you wanna make sure you're using it efficiently. And um, that's a whole class in itself, but some of the things you need, this might be a good time to have an irrigation contractor come out and just do an evaluation on your whole system. Um, do you have any broken heads? Turn them on. You, you're allowed to turn it on during the day if you're out there testing it and not testing it for an hour each zone, but you know, seeing what's going on. Do you have any broken heads? Does it look like Old Faithful out there? Um, do you have any misaligned heads? Are they, is it watering your driveway or your street or your house? Um, the irrigation system is supposed to be watering your lawn, not those other... <laughs> Um, things is is one like just sending out little weird strands it could be full of sand you know we have very sandy soil um, that could happen you need to clean those out are they actually not popping up all the way uh, because weeds or turf or whatever is kind of holding them down once you determine those things you know make sure in an ideal situation you don't have mixed heads in a zone. You don't have the heads that spin around with the heads that go far out and kind of like tsh, 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 like that. You want the same type of heads in the same zone and you want this head to head coverage which this graphic is showing, meaning the water from the sprinkler head on the right reaches all the way to the sprinkler head on the left and vice versa. So you don't have any dry spots and wondering, you know, what's going on here? Why, why are these areas not functioning well? Another thing you can do in the winter is, is I mentioned pulling weeds. It's a great time to pull weeds. Number one, because it's cooler. Number two, because you can see them better <laughs> um, because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of things aren't growing. This right here is showing you an invasive exotic called air potato. Um, we're getting kind of ahead of the air potato because we have an air potato beetle that's joining us in the battle against the air potato. Um, but if you see them, good time to pull up the vines, throw them away, 
Also, it's a great time to actually see the tubers, the potatoes, and pick those up, throw them away with your household trash. And that's just one of the invasive exotics. Um, I have a short video on my Facebook where I have found some skunk vine in my yard. Makes me very unhappy, but I'm going to stay on top of that throughout the winter. Um, any kind, you know, just educate yourself about the invasive exotics. But now's a great time to pull them and throw them away. Unfortunately, invasive exotics are not compostable unless you want more invasive <laughs> exotics. So throw those away uh, with your household trash. Take, you know, great time to be out there. Um, just cleaning up your yard in general, because it's not as hot as it was. It's also a great time to start a compost pile. Um, you can have just a pile like this one. Um, that's all my mother ever had, and she didn't even have those pallets around it. She just had literally a pile um, and used it in her garden. Um, here in Hernando County, um, if you are a resident of Hernando County and you attend a compost workshop, um, you can pick up one of these bins that I'm showing you here, and that's really cool. If um, you're interested in attending a uh, compost workshop, we usually work it in with a rain barrel workshop, please email me um, and I'll get you some information about that. My email is going to be at the end of this presentation. Here's another thing you can do is enjoy some winter annuals and, and veggies so that when you get photos uh, from your family of them buried in the snow, you can send back beautiful photos of the beautiful, colorful, uh, beautiful flowers that's going on in your yard. Here are just a few of the ones that you may consider almost like spring annuals up north, but here they do fantastic in the winter. Snapdragons are one of them. Uh, petunias. And I have this little bee there because I also have another program, which I'm going to remind you about at the end. That's also in my videos as well as on the YouTube about um, pollinator winters, you know, winter pollinators in your Florida yard. <coughs> and they act. In my research, I actually found a few of these annuals will attract uh, pollinators as well. And petunias um, will attract some pollinators for you. It says here, remove in June, early June. <laughs> They're gonna look pretty bad already, probably you know, near the end of May, um, mid-May even. They get long and leggy and they're just not gonna last through the hot winter months, not even those heat wave ones. Pansies, petunias and pansies. You get a bunch of those and put them around your yard. You'll have the most beautiful, colorful winter yard <laughs> in your neighborhood. Calendulas, and that's another pollinating and pollinator attracting plant. These pot marigolds, um, and they look really nice and you can get those, I believe, in varying colors as well. Foxgloves, beautiful. Alyssum says some of these when they say, you know, remove, in my experience, you're probably wanting to remove like a month or so before that. When they start looking bad, they're annuals, you know, they're not going to push through the heat season. Carnations. And you can see there, I think there's some pollinators right on this one. Some ants and things. Dianthus. That'll spread all over the place for you and you can, um, and this actually will withstand the heat for quite some time. So it may make it through July. Um, that's just a few of the annuals. I cover a lot more um, in some of my other videos, but here's some perennials, just a few <laughs> of the perennials. I have um, at the poinsettias, of course, our holiday plants, we can plant them here. Um, Climbing aster I have in this top left. This is a favorite of uh, Frank Galdo, who is the FFL person in Pasco. It's gonna start blooming about now, it's a vine. And um, 
Frank swears that when they, you get a lot of them in bloom, that they smell like baking sugar cookies. So he considers it a, uh, a holiday plant. Also, um, the marble leaf, which is down here, the Persian shield. And this Philippine violet is a fantastic substitution for the invasive exotic Mexican petunia. Um, and I've seen cardinals all over the Philippine violets. They just love them. Here's some um, way, other ways to bring color. Our camellias, of course. Azaleas too, they're going to start blooming, you know, February, March is our azalea time. And a little bit before that, January, February is our uh, camellia time. In the bottom left, we have Laura Pedlums. Now they're gonna be that color all year long for you, but it's a nice way to keep color you see how the, the purple color, because this is a variety called Plum Delight, and that is what is most often available in, in our stores when we buy the Laura Pedlum. Chinese fringe bush is another name for it. But you see it against that uh, golden turf. It's another way to bring some color in. Salt bush is blooming right now. It's a native, and I have it um, in the areas around me where no one has built yet. Um, and it's just blooming like crazy and covered in this white fluffy, um, white fluffy flowers and, and stuff. Hollies, hollies do fantastic all winter long. You really can't go wrong with any kind of hollies. Now's a great time to purchase them because you can tell if you're getting a girl or not because they should be varying at this time. Um, here's just three samples of native hollies. Yopon holly, this is like a tree yopon holly. You can also get a weeping yopon holly, which looks right, like something Dr. Seuss drew. It's really kind of cool. And also a dwarf yopon holly shrub, which make nice rounded, not nice rounded shrubs that you don't really have to do anything too, and they stay looking nice even in a formal yard. The Mary Nell holly here on the left is you know, very tough. It's gonna get pretty tall, but tough holly, you don't have to do anything to. And the East Palaka holly, they have the softer, almost like oak, leaf, um, oak tree kind of leaves. It's a native hybrid and um, makes a great small tree. They even use it in urban settings. That's just three of the many hollies. These all three happen to be native. Hollies always do great here in the winter and then you're providing the berries for the wildlife. Here's some other colorful shrubs out there. Um, here at the top right is the tea olive. I haven't had one of those, but I understand their aroma is fantastic um, when they bloom. So people like to try to have them somewhere around where they spend time so that they can enjoy the aroma. This fire thorn is gonna be loaded um, with berries, bring you a lot of color. And then this native Walter's viburnum, um, gonna have the small white flowers and it's a great wildlife attractor. And you know, sometimes we just need to think out of the box. It's not always just you know, the same old plants that we're used to, why not bring in some ornamental uh, vegetables that are really pretty this time of year? Kale, ornamental kale, giant red mustard, uh, Swiss chard there at the bottom left, An or ornamental cabbage, you can tuck those into a lot of your flower beds. Now these are ornamental um, veggies, but they bring a lot of color and just interest to your to your yard. If you are interested in what actual edible vegetables, you can plant uh, Dr. Lester in the extension office. They're the ones to talk to about the vegetables. I'm, it's not my purview. I mean, I, I kind of know, but not enough to really share <laughs> with people. So here's what you can grow this time of year. Here's the list. And uh, Dr. Lester loves vegetables. And what he does is he tucks the edibles into his normal everyday flower beds. He doesn't necessarily go out there and, you know, dig up a 10 by 20 square in the backyard. His huskies would get into it anyway. So 
he has these built up flower beds, then he'll just stick vegetables in various places around there, which is a really neat thing to do as well. And he can tell you all about that. I think he's gonna be working on vegetables and herbs um, from growing them to then how to prepare them. So look for classes for that as well. What you don't wanna do is uh, fertilize. Um, we're gonna start with the things you shouldn't be doing right now. It's not the time of year to fertilize. And also very soon, uh, we're gonna be in our blackout phase here in Hernando County, January 1st through March 31st, where homeowners are not allowed to fertilize their lawn. That's not a very cumbersome rule because it's not the time of year that we should be fertilizing anyway. Um, this link here, uh, I'll put it back up on my Facebook soon, uh, a video where, that we did about fertilizing, uh, kind of a silly video where Dr. Lester and I are there and they don't pay us to be actors. So just <laughs> be prepared for that. But it's a lot of fun, the video is, and I think you can learn a lot. I'll put it up on my Facebook soon. I, I mean, it's already in the videos, but I'll post it as a post. Uh, I talked about this on Monday's uh, video. You don't, we don't, we're no, weed and feed products are not encouraged by Florida Friendly Landscaping at any time. And right now we're not encouraging fertilizing. First of all, in another month, we'll be in the blackout phase, but you don't need to run out and fertilize now. You should have had that fertilizing done in October if you were going to fertilize. We don't wanna do anything that encourages new growth. And I explained that in detail on Monday's video because new growth is very susceptible to causing um, damage to the rest of the plant if it becomes freeze or frost damaged. Also weed and feed, it's just two different applications that should be done at two different times of year. If you're trying to get a hold of spring weeds, you're gonna wanna put down a pre-emergent right before spring and have fun figuring out what that is, when that is. So, I mean, I would say generally beginning of February and we're still in our blackout phase of fertilizing. Plus, you know, it's not the time even that UF even recommends fertilizing, not in central Florida anyway. And there are other issues, non-target kills, all kinds of issues with, with the weed and feed. And so here's what I explained already about the, uh, the um, weeds, just make those two different applications. It's also not a time to just broadcast, it's never a time to broadcast spray pesticides all over your yard, but especially now in the winter. I have fire ants out there right now that I'm gonna get after, and that's the only thing I ever treat in my yard, and I'm going to spot treat where they are a problem. But generally most insects are also not that active in the winter. So you're not, uh, you're just not accomplishing anything except throwing down chemicals, um, you know, in the winter. Most pest problems occur during periods of active growth. So avoid just blanketing pesticides on your yard. I discussed this um, in Monday's class, pruning. Pruning is just like fertilizing in that it is going to encourage new growth. We don't want to do anything to encourage new growth. What will happen is that new growth that we encourage, because remember I told you we have three days of winter, then it's warm. Then we have three days of winter, then it's warm. In those warm periods, you're going to get some new growth. And then one of those three-day winters comes and zaps that new growth. Well, that new growth is very close to the base of the plant, and, and it, it will bring the damage to the rest of like the core of the plant. That's why we don't wanna do anything. Sometimes it just happens, but we don't wanna do anything to force that to happen. Now, if it's a deciduous um, tree, winter is always a time to prune them, that's fine. But if you have like your azaleas and camellias and spring blooming plants, you should have pruned them by June 30th. If you do it now, 
you won't have your spring flowers. So while well, speaking of deciduous trees and pruning, and I promised I would talk more about this uh, in, in that video I did Monday. Here's your crepe myrtle. <laughs> it's a flowering tree, that's true, but it flowers later. It doesn't really start flowering until about June. It's not a spring flowering plant. And we're gonna go around soon, if not already, and see lots of people uh, doing this awful thing <laughs> to various crepe myrtles, severely pruning them, hat racking them is another name for it. It's not, and they're, well, it's not going to kill your crepe myrtle right away. And that's how they get away with doing it. And people do it because other people do it. And so then they think that's the right thing to do. And they think it, and, you know, and that it makes bigger flowers. It does bigger, fewer flowers. And every year you get basal cell, new whip-like growth that just falls down in a storm because it has bigger, fewer flowers. Plus you have these, these poor truncated um, crate myrtles that get very bulky looking where you cut them year after year after year. I always say they're angry. That's why they're like this. They're like, why did you do this to me? If you leave a crepe myrtle in its natural form, it has a beautiful trunk, beautiful winter interest. I'm not saying don't prune it at all. Actually, nothing bad will happen to you if you don't prune it at all or the tree, but there is a proper way to prune it and just cutting it so severely is not the way to do it. I have recently put a video Dr. Lester and I made a couple years ago on my Facebook page that'll walk you through um, how to properly prune your crepe myrtle. Basically what you wanna do is um, anything inside there, I would say that's the width of a pencil or less, cut that out, get all that twiggy new growth out. If you have any crossing branches, go ahead and prune those so they don't end up rubbing and causing problems. You can take the black calyx, calyx flower things off, but I wouldn't. I mean, some birds actually eat those. Um, there's gonna be suckers around the bottom. Get those if there's weeds growing up through. You know, just clean it out and air it out, but don't severely prune it. Save the poor crepe myrtles. Here's another uh, thing not to do. Don't stress, don't expect perfection. This year we've been telling ourselves a lot, you know, just give up everything that you've been stressing about because it's not <laughs> all that important. We're not tropical. We're not meant to be green all year long. We have winters. So it's okay to have a golden lawn. See, I'm working on changing. Uh, the mindset with, with changing the vernacular. We have golden waves of lawns. Um, if it's Bahia, it's gonna come right back. Even your St. Augustine is going to come right back. Remember I told you all of our grasses are warm season grasses. That's why they go dormant in the winter. Up north, you may have had uh, Kentucky bluegrass or some kind of fescue. If you remember back, if you had a really hot, dry August and September, they turned golden like this, didn't they? But yet they're green under the snow. And you're like, how does that work? Those types of grasses are cold season grasses, cool season grasses. That's when they thrive. Ours, for reasons of practicality, we chose warm season grasses because we are in warm seasons most of the time. So it's okay for it to go this shade of golden during the winter. If you had some plant damage, which I may, because remember I, I told you there's some tough love going on out there, there at survival of the fittest. And I have a lot of natives, not all natives, but a lot of natives. So they might be um, frost damaged, but we didn't have any kind of freeze that would have affected the roots 
What you don't want to do is go out and immediately cut all the ugly looking stuff off. You want to wait until that March 15th for a couple of reasons. We already talked about what pruning does. Pruning encourages new growth. New growth is susceptible to cold damage. So when we have one of those three day winter spurts, um, you know, they could get really damaged and cause more damage to the plant. The other thing in those warm times in between our three day winters, we are gonna have new growth just naturally. Well, that damaged um, growth will kind of protect it when we do have another frost or freeze. So that's another reason we don't wanna remove it right away. We have to learn to live with the ugly till the danger of frost or freeze is over. Here's a few other things, you know, you can put on your list of things to do. Set up a rain barrel. Not gonna rain in it a lot <laughs> right now, but you, good time to get it set up. And again, I'll show you my email at the end if you're interested to know when the next rain barrel um, and composting workshop will be. We've been doing them simultaneously quite a bit. Good time to go out there and um, make some patios or, or decks or repair them, um, limit or reduce your lawn areas with other, you know, cool areas to be in, bringing in more hardscape. Hardscape is anything that isn't plants in your yard. As I said, creating bigger beds, now's a great time to do that so that we're not tempted to use too much water on our lawns or if there's an area lawn just refuses to grow or something else there. Collect fun yard art like this flower bed here on, on the left. Um, educate yourself, attend classes. Now we can do that via Zoom without having even to go anywhere. So, I mean, you could get in if you had the time, several classes a day. Plus, now that we're recording them, you can also catch them on your schedule. It's a good time to go out and what does this mean? Conduct a site analysis and landscape plan. It means you go out and make a sketch of what is already going on in your yard. Draw your house in there and say, okay, over here it's sunny and I have, you know, some tree. Well, that wouldn't make sense. It's shady and I have some trees. Over here it's sunny and I have nothing but weeds growing. Over here is where my air conditioner is. So you're doing a site analysis. And then you create a landscape plan. The first one is what you have. The second one is what you want. And then you learn to work from there. Good time to do something like that. Here's just some um, for, for in honor of our winter landscape class, like I said, winter cooperated with me. So this is a little bit of what my yard looked like early this morning. So had a little bit of fun with that. Up here in northwest uh, Hernando County, as you see, we did experience some, some frost going on. That beauty berry, what's going to happen to it now is it's this about the time probably when it's going to turn uh, kind of black which the birds almost prefer that because they prefer the beautyberry raisins because <laughs> it has a higher amount of sugar. The beautyberries really aren't that sweet. Here um, is my Facebook page at Hernando FFL program. And on there, as well as on Hernando County YouTube channel, you can find these three classes that I have done recently. You can find other classes as well, but these three will pertain to what we were talking about today and expand upon it. Landscape plants to usher in the holidays. Frank Galdo and I did that. Well worth watching. It's a lot of fun and he has a lot of creative ideas and some recipes in there too. Uh, creating a winter wildlife oasis. That's what I was talking about with the pollinators. Um, it's a great one to watch. And I did that short one on Monday about winter is coming because I knew the freeze was gonna beat me uh, to this class. So um, concentrate a little bit more on freeze protection in that one. Okay, let's see if we have anything in the chat. 
I have a few questions here. Let's see. Where can you buy pansies and carnations? Probably in the big box stores. Um, I would call around and ask them. They should have them. Um, I did not see where pansies weren't listed. And I'm not sure about snapdragons, but I know pansies were not listed as a pollinator attractor, but the petunias sure were. Um, someone's asking, can you use homemade compost fertilizer? Um, yes, you can. You can use that probably at any time, but I still wouldn't want to do anything to encourage new growth, but homemade compost um, fertilizer is not ultra high in nitrogen. So you're probably pretty safe using that. And is that the right way to trim with the blade up that one picture that I showed? Um, maybe I can get Dr. Lester to do a class on pruning, but generally, yes. <laughs> um, you wanna always prune at an angle. You never wanna prune something straight and flat because that could encourage moisture to just sit there and cause um, you know, problems. So at an angle allows moisture to roll off of it. And plus shrubs and things like that, that, that wasn't really showing a shrub, but the way you prune shrubs is you want them wider at the bottom than at the top, not a triangle, <laughs> but somewhat wider at the bottom of the top. So you're gonna have to be at that angle like this to accomplish that. And that allows sunlight to get in through the entire shrub. So you don't have die out inside of the shrub. Okay, I think that's all of the questions. Um, oh, let me see, there might be one more message down here. Um, I, somebody's asking if uh, Philippine violet is invasive. Not that I have heard, but things change. So, um, one of the best places to check is the um, Center for in Invasive and Aquatic Plants. Center for Invasive and Aquatic Plants. You can look that up. That's a UF um, department and see if Philippine violet has made it on that list. Um, to my knowledge, it hadn't at some point. And you can also just look up Philippine violet and then put UF for University of Florida and see what they have to say about it. Um, yes, the people are asking where these annuals are. I haven't actually been out to look. Usually the big box stores is pretty good about having <laughs> the proper um, annuals to buy. So, you know, you can call there and find out first. All right, let me move things around and we'll stop the recording for now. Uh, thank you, everybody. And oh, my next class before I move on. My next scheduled class is not until December 22nd. And that's going to be a checklist of a Florida, uh, Florida friendly certified yard. You can actually uh, be certified as a Florida friendly yard. I'm not sure. I can't promise um, <laughs> that I would be out to uh, check your yard, you know, going through all the processes for quite some time, because in the next month or so, I don't know what COVID is doing, none of us do. But there is a process, but I'm not even pushing the process that, oh, you have to be officially certified. What is interesting to know is how, you know, what is the checklist? And, you know, you may be interested in like, hmm, does my yard fit that checklist? So we're just gonna go um, over that as well. Yes, and um, there will there should be a Zoom link um, on the Facebook page that will help you get to that class on the 22nd. Next week, I was going to do a rain barrel class. That's why I didn't have a regular class scheduled, but there's not enough interest at Christmas. So don't be surprised if I don't have a surprise <laughs> class up. I don't know quite yet what it'll be. But if not, I will see you on the 22nd for that Florida Friendly checklist. Thank you, everybody. And I'm going to turn the recording off now. So everyone who's watching via recording, have a great 
holiday and stay warm and stay safe.